All right. Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Eliezer Tauber, founder and first chair of the Degrees uh, at Bar Ilan University, as well as the former dean of its Faculty of Jewish Studies, yeah. join us to discuss Dear Yassin, the massacre that never was. Professor Tauber will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Eliezer Tauber. Okay, thank you very much. You know, the so-called uh, Diyasin Massacre, as it, is, as, it was, as it was called in the Palestinian narrative, was one of the founding misses of the Palestinian narrative. According to this myth, a combined force of two paramilitary Jewish organizations, one called the uh, Etzel, the British called it the Irgun, the other one called the Lehi, the British called it the Sterngang. So according to the Palestinian narrative, those two uh, Jewish paramilitary organizations on April 9th, 1948, attacked a peaceful Arab village called Dir Yassin, west of Jerusalem, and massacred almost all of its, its inhabitants, to be more exact, 254 people. Now this um, massacre story served as a proof for the Palestinian propaganda for more than seven decades to show the inhumanity of the Israelis, how they actually attacked a peaceful Arab village and massacred almost all of its inhabitants. According to the narrative, the massacre was also accompanied by rapes and all kinds of other atrocities. So about 30 years ago, when I was just a PhD student, uh, I conducted a small research about the affair and I reached the conclusion that you don't have two version, versions which say, say the same things. So I decided that I should go deeper into the affair. Many people are, like Daniel Pipes asked me to carry on a full scale research about the affair. It took me several uh, decades until I decided to do this research, but it was for the better because first of all, my method became, uh, methods of research became improved over the years. And also there was very, some very important sources that were available do, only during uh, the last decades. Now, I decided to do something which none implemented before me, namely, Everyone was saying there was a massacre, there was no massacre, it was futile. So I decided that if there was a massacre, there should have been people massacred. I mean, you don't have a massacre if you don't have people massacred. So I decided to verify the exact circumstances of death of each of the villagers uh, killed in the scene in that fateful day. Now, people didn't believe that I will be able to, to do it because I mean, more than 70, 70 years passed, passed since the affair. But eventually I was successful and I managed to find first, in the first stage, all the names of all the people killed in the Yassin. And then in the second stage, I managed to verify the exact circumstances of death of all the people killed them. Now, how could I achieve such a success of verifying the exact circumstances of death of people killed over than 70 years ago? As a researcher who masters Arabic, I was able to use all the evidence, all the testimonies from the survivors of the Yassin. Now you should realize that 90% of the population survived. So there was a huge amount of testimonies. Now, of course, there were also testimonies given by the Jewish fighters, either from Etzel or from Lehi, but no one believed them because if you are committing, committing a massacre, evidently, evidently you will lie about the circumstances. So you cannot base yourself as a, researchers, as a researcher on the evidence given by the Jewish side. But I decided to lay heavily on the evidence given by the Arab sides, by the people of Dir Yassin. And I was very much surprised to learn that the testimonies of the survivors from Dir Yassin was very similar to the testimonies of the Jewish attackers at times, even identical. 
the testimony is were so identical that I, I could identify specific events during the battle. And I have, for example, a testimony given by a former Israeli minister who was a young soldier uh, in the Lehi organization in 1948. And then I had a testimony given by a, an Arab survivor and I could easily see that both of them were uh, speaking about the same event during that fateful day. So my method was indeed to combine both versions of both the Jewish attackers and the Arab survivors in order to yield one combined narrative of the affair, which will give me the true story of what happened in those days. Now, and the conclusions were that Diresin was not the peaceful village it was later claimed by many people. It was a fortified village with scores of armed combatants and huge amount of arms. How did the villagers of Diresin manage to have so much uh, weapons, even automatic weapons, because they sent a mission to purchase arms in Egypt. And that mission, unluckily for them, arrived back in the village five days before of the attack with huge amount of automatic weapons, including machine gun, heavy machine guns. Now, why I'm saying that it was unlucky for them? Because if they wouldn't have weapons, they would run away because the attackers uh, warned them in advance by, by a loudspeaker car to run away. And many of them ran away, but many of them decided to remain and fight the Jews. Now, if they wouldn't have weapons, they would also run away and save their lives. But because they have amount of, an amount of weapon which was no less than the weapons uh, that owned by the attackers, they decided to stay. And it was a fierce 10 hour battle between the attacking Jews and the defenders of Diresin. And it was in the presence of civilian population. And eventually after 10, a 10 hour battle, it ended with the Jewish Parami military organization, organizations winning the battle. And there was no massacre. When the battle ended, the killing stopped. So eventually about 100 people of the villagers were killed. Many of them were armed combatants, about a quarter of them were armed combatants. It is not true that almost all of those killed were women, children, and old people. I mean, there were about 50 odd percent and almost 50 percent were uh, men in the age of fighting and a quarter of the people killed were armed combatants. And after I managed to verify the exact circumstances of death of each of the people killed, I reached the conclusion that there was no massacre, but a battle and only a battle. Now, if I'm telling that there was a battle, how is it that everyone else believe that there was a massacre? Why? because the Arab leadership of Jerusalem decided intentionally to invent a massacre narrative. Now, why should they do this? Because the supreme uh, Arab personality in, Ju in Jerusalem in those days, he was a gen secretary general of the Arab higher uh, committee. He was called Dr. Hussein Fakhri al-Khalidi. Now he was practical enough to understand that the Arab fighters, the Palestinian fighters in Palestine had no chance against the Jewish fighters. So he wanted to lay pressure on the Arab governments surrounding Palestine so they, they would invent, invade Palestine with their armies and help the Palestinians to defeat the Jews. And in order to lay this pressure on the Arab governments, he decided intentionally to invent the massacre narrative. How do I know this? Because I managed to read an interview conducted with his assistant called Hazem Nusayb, later on he was a foreign minister in Jordan, and not just the few seconds that everyone knows from a famous TV show in Britain in 1998, but I managed to read the whole 32-page manuscript 
uh, typescript of the interview held with him about the affair, and he said frankly the entire story, how his boss, Hussein Fakhri al-Hadi, decided to invent the massacre narrative, and it was done against the express will of the survivors of Dir Yassin who opposed it, because you should understand the conflict of interest. The survivors of Dir Yassin felt that they fought from a street to street, from a house to house until the last bullet. Now, Khaledi decided it was against the Palestinian interest to expose this truth. According to him, the Palestinian interest was to present the villagers of Dir Yassin as helpless people slaughtered by Arab Jews. So against their will, and he ordered them not to contradict him, there are many testimonies telling how the villagers protested against it, and he overrides them, overrode them, and he decided to invent this massacre narrative. And since his, since his assistant, Hazen Nuseiba, was the man responsible for the Arab, Arabic broadcasts of the Palestine Broadcast Corporation, he managed to spread the, man, the massacre narrative all over Palestine. And what was the result? The result was that it boomeranged. Namely, as one of the survivors said, Dr. Hussein Fakhri al-Khaldi was the one who caused the catastrophe, the Nakba. Why? He wanted to lay pressures on the Arab government, but the result was different. The result was that the Palestinians believed the massacre narrative and the star started to run away. In the late 1990s, the Palestinian Authority conducted a statistical research among the Palestinian survivors, the, the refugees from the 1948 war, why did they fled Palestine? And a huge amount of them said that they did it because they believed in the Dir Yassin massacre. So basically, if you compare the numbers, the number of refugees after the affair is 10 times more than the number of Palestinians who fled Palestine be before the affair. So basically, what do we have here? We have here a massacre that never happened, but because that the Palestinians believed in the false narrative of a massacre invented intentionally by their leadership, the Palestinians decided to flee Palestine. So this affair is used against Israel to smear Israel's name as an inhumane state uh, massacring people, and it uh, was carried on like this for the last seven decades. Also in the United States, there is an organization promoting the massacre narrative, uh, but now I can tell you, you can treat it as an of, as official, it is official. There was no massacre in Dir Yassin. I'm open now to answer questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. The first one we have in is from uh, Dangles or D. Angles. Uh, how have your conclusions been received by one, the Arab world, two, the Jewish world, and three, in general? Well, I can tell you the most important issue is, and the most interesting one is how it was received by the academy. I had to publish the, my book, which is called The Massacre That Never Was, by a trade publisher. Why? I first of all uh, apply to many leading university presses, one of the most important university presses in the United States. And all of them said that the book is magnificent. It is very strong. It, it is precisely because of this that they are not going to publish it because it might harm Palestinian interests. So basically here we have academic professors betraying the profession and deciding to try to conceal a book in order because of political consideration, which is also ridiculous. I mean, in the 91st century, you cannot block a book. Eventually it was published by a trade publisher, by the Toby Press, and everyone can uh, buy it and read it. It was accepted, uh, you know, even uh, many people say, come on, this professor is from Bayern University, he is rightist. I'm not a rightist, neither a leftist. But I can tell you that uh, the Daily Haaretz in Israel, which is considered the most leftist newspaper, already published three book reviews about this book, and all of them were very positive, including one uh, written by a Palestinian. 
because people can agree or disagree with the conclusions, but no one before me managed to conduct such an in, a, 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 a profound research about the DRS and FR. No one before me managed to collect all these Arab testimonies, and no one before me managed to verify the exact circumstances of death of each of the people killed them. So basically, it was uh, welcomed very positively by both Jews and I believe uh, Palestinians, at least according to those who wrote about it. It was not perceived posit positively by American professors. Thank you. And we do have an anonymous attendee that asked, uh, you said a quarter of the people were killed were armed combatants, uh, would, which would suggest that three quarters were not armed uh, and presumably were civilians. Is that correct? Yes, this, this is correct. Now, you should understand that the battle took place in the presence of civilians. So I can bring you an example. There is a family. One of the family is an armed combatant. He's holding a rifle. And the family decided to surrender. I know that because I read the testimony given by a woman who was the only one to survive this event. And they decided to go out. The woman came first with a white flag, and the attackers who belonged to the Etzel organization wanted to collect them, uh, take them uh, as prisoners of war. But then one of them, who was the armed combatant, came out with his rifle in his hand. One of you was stupid. He had to throw it away, not to come with a rifle in his hand. And immediately, one of the fighters threw a hand grenade at them, killing all the four uh, men who were not combatants who accompanied him. Now, he, he, this uh, fighter, he is not like me. I am an historian. I know both sides, so I know that they intended to surrender. But this fighter was just seeing an Arab coming with a rifle, so he immediately threw a hand grenade. I mean, he couldn't tell him, could all tell all the other uh, Arabs around him, go away, I'm throwing a hand grenade, because he could be killed. So he immediately did what he, he saw to be the right thing to do, to save his own life. As one of the leaders of the Lehi organization later on said, it was a matter of we, either that we are killed or those who are shooting at us are killed. So if someone, he was quite an old uh, armed combatant from Diyasin, he was shooting at the attackers from the window of his uh, home. And near him was a cradle with an infant. And in order to silence the fire, they throw a hand grenade at him through the window. They didn't know that there was a cradle with an infant beside him. And this, he was killed by the hand grenade, and the infant was killed by the hand grenade. This is not a massacre. This is people fighting each other, and they didn't have the, clue, the slightest clue that there was a baby near the one who was shooting at them. So the, because many civilians decided to remain, this is why. Uh, many civilians uh, were killed in the attack. Thank you for expanding on that. Uh, Richard Galber asks, uh, states, I have read your book and found it very eye-opening. I have two questions. One, how much has the evidence and testimony of Mayor Pa'il uh, influenced the negative view of the Herzl and Lechi actions, especially in Israel? And two, speaking to Shimon Monitor, he said to me that when they arrived at Deir Yassin, some of the Lechi had more weapons and ammunition. Do you think that was correct? Well, first of all, let us refer to Mayor Pale. I mean, he, among the Jews, he disseminated the, the massacre story. I proved in the book that he was not there when it happened. I can now give you a scoop. After that the book was published, I managed to find one of the last interviews given by Pa'il before he passed away in which he admitted that he wasn't there. So the story is closed regarding, regarding to Mayor Pa'il. It was too late for the book. It was after the book was published that I found this interview. As regard to Shimon Monita, I myself spoke with him several times. And I mean, he was just a simple warrior. Flechi was not one of the commander. So his point of view was very limited. And actually, as an historian, I could tell him many new things about that fateful day that he was there, but he didn't know and I knew. Oh, thank you so much. All right, uh, Steve asks, have there been any reviews by Israeli post-Zionist uh, historians? One of those who very much support my book is Benny Morris. 
So I don't know what Ilan Papa would say about the book, but Benny Morris definitely think very favorably about my book. Actually, Benny Morris was the one who gave me all the documents from the IDF archives that were closed to the public. You know, the Israeli Supreme Court of Justice uh, forbade, uh, <laughs> forbade uh, opening this document to the documents to the public. He, there was a certain period of time when they were open and Bernie Morris photocopied them all and he gave me photocopies of all these documents. So from, from my point of view, the Israeli Supreme Court of Justice just prevented other researchers from being able to use the documents like I used them, but everything was used. And I thank very, thank very, uh, here, can thank here very, Benny Morris for providing me with these documents. Thank you. Uh, David Naret asks, uh, what was Menachem Begin's uh, plan of attack and strategic goals prior to the attack? Well, the, the attackers wrongly believed that Dirasin was, uh, was inhabited by many Iraqi soldiers. There were no foreign soldiers in Dirasin. All the fighters there were local. The attackers also uh, wrongly believed the DSN was a link between uh, the Samaria region and the battle over Castel. This was also wrong. Although indeed several fighters from DSN helped the brethren in Castel to fight the Jews. But the intelligence that the, the in, in, intelligence information that both organizations had about DSN was very poor. They didn't know even about the weapons. They didn't know about the fortifications. They didn't know anything. As one of them later on said, if we would use it to, if we could, if we, if we would know the truth about so much weapons and everything, maybe we will change our minds and we wouldn't attack, one of them said. But the, the, the intelligence that they had was very poor regarding anything related to the village. Thank you. Marvin Lipich asks, uh, you said the, def the defenders were warned by a loudspeaker vehicle, but did not the vehicle get stuck in a ditch before it could get to the village? The vehicle was uh, was stopped because indeed it uh, rolled over into, uh, it was not a ditch, it was two meters uh, deep. And it, it was uh, dug by the villagers in order to stop tanks, not just a car. But I have uh, many testimonies from people all over the Resin. I mean, Arab people from the Resin, and it was the warnings were heard almost everywhere, not everywhere, but almost everywhere. And those who didn't hear it saw the people who did hear it running away and they followed them. So basically, from the 1,000 uh, people of the Resin, 700 uh, followed the warnings and they ran away and 200 and 100 were killed and 200 were taken prisoner by the Jewish fighters and safely released in Arab Jerusalem. Thank you. Always good to, to have those facts. Uh, Ephraim Perlmutter asks, what was the motive of the Red Cross representative in his report on the event? The Red Cross representative report was, according to my view, a very fair re report. I mean, he, he, he didn't visit the entire village. He just saw the first houses of the village, got some impression. And later on, he also was one of the reasons why the, at first they saw that the number of people killed was so high, about 250. He did some calculations which were utterly wrong, but he didn't do it because of some uh, ulterior motives. This is what he believed to be the truth, and this is what he reported to Geneva. But he was wrong, and the people of Dirasin themselves within days knew the exact number of people killed, and we have many testimonies from those days of survivors of Dir from Dirasin saying that the number of people killed was around 100. Thank you. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, why would a Palestinian leader want to invent a story that caused his people to leave Palestine? I guess this was just unintentional, correct? Hazem Nuseba was in, his insistent, said openly, we didn't understand the way of thinking of our own people. We wanted to do good and eventually boomeranged. Evidently, he wanted to do good. He, he, in his memoirs, he gave many reasons. Uh, this Hussein Fakhri al Khaldi, he published a, a three volume memoir and he gave many reasons why he did it. I mean, ap apologetical reasons. 
and you, which you, you, you can uh, show that each one of them is incorrect. For example, he said, this is information that I got uh, from reports, but I have the reports that he got and the information was different. For example, he said, the people of Dira Sin themselves spread the rumors, which is also against the truth because the people of Dira Sin told him not to spread such rumors, etc., etc. But he, he believed that as a leader of the Palestinians, he is saving them. You see, I'm more liberal about him. I'm not saying that he caused a catastrophe. I'm saying that he wanted to prevent a catastrophe but eventually it caused ones. I understand. Uh, another anonymous attendee asks, isn't it true that Ben-Gurion and his political allies also spread the false narrative because they thought it would harm their political rivals? Well, th this is true. Ben-Gurion knew the truth because he got, he got uh, the true information very shortly thereafter. And he knew the truth. He knew that uh, two units of the Palmach, the striking force of the Haganah, the militia, militia of the mainstream uh, main, mainstream issue also participated in the battle. He, he knew that too, and he was interested indeed in order to smear the, the good name of the two organizations. But I belittle the influence of the Jewish propaganda. I know many people uh, uh, like uh, to go deeper into the Jewish-Jewish conflict, but eventually the Dirasin affair is an affair between Jews and Arabs, and it was the Arabs the Palestinian leadership to, to be blamed for spreading this false narrative of the massacre. The Jews uh, helped them in the margins. Thanks. Uh, Morris asks, were you able to interview any of the Arabs who were taken from Deir Yassin uh, and released into West Jerusalem as you just, as you earlier described? No, most of those uh, who gave, uh, delivered the testimonies died in the early, uh, one of the last of them, I think, the last uh, survivors that gave testimonies died in uh, 2012, etc. And, and I was writing the book later on, but so in, in any case, 70, 70 odd years after the affair, you don't remember correctly, but I have scores of interviews and testimonies delivered few years after the affair, which are much more effective than taking a testimony 70 years after the affair. And in any case, most of them are already passed, already passed away. Also, most of the Jewish attackers passed away. I managed to catch one of the commanders of, Jew, of the Jewish attackers called the Professor Yudel Lapidot. Um, I managed to catch him, but you know, almost all of the people involved in the, in the affair are no longer alive in these days. It's still incredible how much information you were able to gather there. Uh, William Wolf and Steve also ask, uh, is this merely a fair falsehood uh, within the larger false Palestinian narrative? Uh, this is merely one falsehood in the large within the larger false Palestinian narrative. Problem is that this narrative has been winning a war where facts don't matter, only propaganda. Why is Israel's conduct in this war so ineffective? Look, I'm a researcher, I'm an historian, and I'm a researcher of Middle Eastern studies, and I conducted a full-scale research about the Irasin. I'm not an expert on Israeli propaganda or Israeli asbar or whatever. You should ask other people why they are so clumsy in this. But I can tell you that I offered the former uh, vice uh, foreign minister to use my book, and she didn't even bother to answer. So, and I mean, they are clumsy because they have a very good uh, tool here in order uh, to show the falsehood of Palestinian propaganda and they don't use it. Why? As I said, you should ask other people. Absolutely, and an anonymous attendee does comment on that incredibly most important research, but of course, uh, great importance is the degree of which academic and other minds are open enough to hear and consider the evidence. Do you think that people are becoming more open to it now or still? Yes, definitely people are more open to it now. There were already many, many reviews written about the Hebrew edition, which was published in, 19, in 2017. And there are, there are also already several reviews about the English edition. And eventually, I mean, you cannot prevent the publication of a book and people will read it and will use it. And it is also already appearing in footnotes, etc. And all those uh, 
uh, respectful important uh, professors who try to block it in all kind of various committees of university presses, evidently they failed. Absolutely. And before we go, can you tell our viewers where we can find your book? My book can be bought in, uh, in Amazon. Uh, you can also buy it in, in the Israeli publisher, uh, Toby Press. They also had uh, offices in the States. But I mean, the, the, most, the easiest thing is to uh, buy it uh, in Amazon. It is called The Massacre That Never Was, The Miss of Dir Yassin and the Creation of the Palestinian Refugee Problem. All right. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Professor Talber, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. For our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for Israel Insider. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.